Hey guys, it's Lainey, host of the True Crime Fan Club podcast. If you're a true crime addict like I am, then my podcast is for you. It's a podcast for the ultimate true crime enthusiast, giving you a glimpse into the life and crimes of the most demented minds. You won't want to miss an episode. Hey Tobin. What you doing? Um, you want to be on a podcast? Mm-hmm. Okay. So our podcast is about crime. Do you know what crime is? No. It's like when bad guys do bad things and the police have to get them. Are you a good guy or a bad guy? I'm a good guy. You're a good guy? Mm-hmm. Is mommy a good guy? Mm-hmm. It's about Gagu. Yes. Okay. Gagu's good. a good guy too. Oh, thank so God. So we don't have to worry about the police coming to get us. Oh, uh, yes. Do <gasps> you know? We do? Or no, we're... Oh, no, we're, no, we're, no, okay. no. Okay. All right. Good. Do you know any crimes? Yes. It's like steal money for some robbers. Like someone used to pay money so bad, then they always steal it. Uh huh. Mm. That would be a crime. Yeah. Yeah. What would happen? Then the police had to come get them. If and they're good what? police, because sometimes the police slip up and let this robber just keep stealing whatever he wants from this old man. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. That is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> It makes Gagu so mad, too. Ugh. What would happen if the police came and got the guys who were stealing money? Um, then they have to give them back. They have to give the money back? Yeah. Yeah, and then what happens to them? Then they go to jail. What is jail? <gasps> they only have to be put in a cage. In a cage? <laughs> yeah. With, like, bars? Yeah, with oh. bars. With some are next to the other bad guys. So Ooh. bad guys are next to the other bad guys. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sometimes they scare them. Yeah. Do you know any other crimes? Like what? Like if someone stole one of your toys. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Would the police come for that? Oh, you yeah? For your toy? Yeah. If they, like, steal uh-huh. it really bad and want it really bad, uh huh. then they steal it sometimes. Oh, my gosh. What about crimes in the car? Can you get in trouble when you're driving a car? Yeah, if you're like a kid or something. If you're a kid? What yeah. else could get you in trouble while you're driving a car? Like, if you're not driving anything, it goes by itself. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I did that the other day. I was just in the car seat. Um. Um, there's no mommy and daddy driving it. Oh, I, I think <laughs> this must have been a dream, just for the record. <laughs> I had a little bad dream. Oh, yeah. okay. That was a bad dream. It was yeah. scary for me. And you were in the car seat and no one was driving the car? Yeah. Oh, my was, gosh. That was so scary. Oh, my Yikes. gosh. It did not have an eye or a mouth. <gasps> Stuff. Do you know more crimes? What do you know? I know if someone um likes to steal both of your toys. Oh, everything's about stealing toys. your toys. I think you're a little worried. Yeah. Then um, if they steal your toys, they have a pile of toys. Yeah, then, but then they have to give it back, then right? Then they please um come get them and give the older mm-hmm. toys back to the kids. Yeah, um, okay. Then they be put. In cages with bars. Yikes. Do they get food or anything? Um, they, yes, they get nasty food. Ooh. Ooh. Nasty food. That doesn't sound like fun at all. No. But then if they say they're sorry, can they get out? If they, if they promise to be good again. Yeah. Oh. And then okay. they can go home. Mm-hmm. Welcome to Crying Crazy, the weekly true crime podcast with Aaron Plum. Hey! And Jordan Middleton. That's me! Well, join us each week as we prove that we know almost nothing about our legal system, but we really are crazy for a good true crime story. So, hey, Jordan, how are you? I have been better. Yeah? You don't sound great. What's wrong? Dying. You're dying again. Uh, Right. But a different type of dying. Okay. This time it's in my throat, and it's like a viral thing. You stay yeah. over there on your side of the couch. No, yeah. I I asked him if it was contagious, and he was kind of like, I mean, I wouldn't go like spreading your spit around. I'm like, ew, why would you say it like that? Well, I promise not so. to kiss you on the podcast. Yes, please don't, because then you'll be sick. Right. Plus, then so. there might be like a murder plot in our future, and oh yeah, 
That'd be bad. My daughter's way too young to date a 19 year old. So yeah, (laughs) we're not doing any of that. No, save the family. (laughs) But how are you? I'm pretty good. It's Tuesday, so I'm yeah. tired. Mm-hmm. But it's a gorgeous day. I know. It was so pretty outside today. My dogs were, I mean, obviously they're the cutest thing, but they were so cute outside and they were just in the grass. And I was like, Julius, why don't you move into the sunshine? And he did. He scooted his big old body past <laughs> the shade line to the sun and just stopped. And I'm like, you are so lazy, but you're so cute. <laughs> I love your dogs. They're very, they're so great. My dogs are just, they just do whatever they can to get on the podcast. Like, well, Zoe's now scratching at her collar. She's like, know. hey. We'll have to see because I can't talk too soon because I don't know what mine will do if we ever record at my house. Right. I mean, they are couch potatoes, but they might really decide they're going to start, like, roughhousing, and that sounds right. like two lions fighting. So well, That would be kind of amusing, though. Yeah. I... Although these guys, even though they weigh, like, 10 pounds, they do make a lot of noise when they roughhouse. It's kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> The day that we researched at your house, they were really quiet. That's true. That was in their midday nap. Well, maybe we should podcast midday at your house to avoid all the animals. Yep. Okay, so, Jordan. Yeah. What crime didn't you do this week? Don't say murder. (sighs) (laughs) Well, it was almost murder, but it was like Mike and I were about to kill this lady, but... No, that's not what I mean. (laughs) No, but seriously, like, I did want to go and yell at this lady. I actually did yell at her, but I wanted to go back and, like, on the way home, I thought of all the things I could have done to her that were illegal that would have been a crime if she called the cops. (laughs) 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 If I got caught. But she was so nasty and so rude, and I was just not having it. So I did yell at her. Can I ask you another question? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, Jordan, what crime did you research but not bring tonight? Mm -mm. Or what did you see this week that you decided not to tell us about? Well, I always watch Live PD, and Mike wanted me to cover one of the stories from that, but I was trying to explain to him that now I'm realizing crimes have to be about a year old, so you can find everything, like the affidavits are released and stuff like that, but it was sad because we fell asleep watching it, and I guess at the end of the episode, because it goes into like 2 a.m. or something, or 1 a.m. Oh, I mean, I guess It goes late, yeah, and I mean, it's live, so they do it, but I guess um, they found a child wandering around in the streets <gasps> oh and my. come to find out that his mother had been shot at the, at her house. Oh, no. And that, um, I think it was the boyfriend was the suspect, and they he turned himself in or something. Oh, my gosh. I know. How old was the kid? Um, I don't know if I remember. Like, little, little, or, like, grade school? Or I think, like, like little, but, like, old enough to be like, oh, I know where I live. Oh like, my yeah, gosh, that's like, so I think sad. he directed the cops back there. Yeah, so Mike's like, you should cover that. And I said, oh, no, I can't. And he said, why is it, like, too soon, or uh, too sad? And I said, no, it's too soon. And I was like, I hate to say that, but right. it is sad. Right. I don't know. Last time you did the child, yeah, not child killer, killer child. Yeah. Ugh. yeah. Ugh. That still creeps me out. Actually, I have one t- tonight about a child that got killed. <gasps> I know. No one dies in mine. Really? People die a lot of people of get hurt. Yeah. But no one dies. So what did you look up that you did not use tonight? Um, so I started to look up... I guess if I'm going to ask that question, I should have an answer, right? <laughs> I started to look up one. Oh, you know which one I really want to do, but I just didn't feel like I had time this week, and I don't know... If I'd ever have time. Do you know who D.B. Cooper is? That sounds so familiar. That he, well, it's the name they gave to a person that hijacked a plane and stole lots of money and disappeared yeah. and it's unsolved. And That sounds familiar. Um, I think it was like Stuff You Should Know or Stuff You Missed in History. One of those podcasts, one of the Stuff podcasts yeah. covered it, did a whole episode on it. Why does that sound so familiar to me? Like, how do I know that? I, I don't know. But anyway, that's the one I wanted to do, but I, um, I want to do a good job on it. So I feel like it needs a whole lot of research and it might be a more than one episode kind of thing. That'd be cool though. Yeah. No, I think that one's pretty neat. Um, I did do one about Mary Fagan. Do you want me to go first tonight? Sure. Cause you're going last too. Oh yeah. So. I am going last. So our job tonight is to try to save your voice, but you still have to gasp and laugh and get irate. Oh, I think I, I don't think I could stop that. 
I noticed we're both a little short tempered today. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, all right. Well, this should make you nice and angry. Okay, good. I'm ready. All right. So, this is a, sort of an old one. Um, and actually, I'm going to give a shout out early tonight. Okay. And it's a shout out that I, I've given before. So, Amanda, my mm-hmm. friend Amanda M, um, she gave me this idea this week for this story. I actually had another one all written out and I'm going to just do a shorter version of it at the end. Okay. Um, but then she was like, Oh, you should cover this. And we started talking about it and I started looking into it and then, Oh my gosh, it's such a great story. So, um, so thanks Mandy. I appreciate it. Now I have all kinds of stuff. I don't know. I hope that we can fit it in one episode. It's like 20 pages long in my notes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So, uh, Mary Fagan. In April 27th, 1913, this man named Newt Lee went to the basement of the pencil factory that he worked in Mm -hmm. to use the bathroom, and he discovered the body of 13-year-old Mary Fagan. Oh. Yes. Why did he go to the bathroom in the basement? That's like the creepiest place. I knew that you were going to ask that. Because my friend had a basement, and I hated always having to go downstairs to use the bathroom. If someone was on, like, the ground floor, I'd go upstairs rather than going downstairs to the basement to go to the bathroom. As far as I could tell, the basement was in... I mean, the bathroom was in the basement. And that was, like, it. And that was it. Oh. Although, there's something at the very, very end, and so we'll come back to that, okay. where they uncover, like, a little bit of evidence that makes me kind of wonder if maybe people just used the bathroom in the basement, mm. but there wasn't actually a bathroom in the basement. Oh. So maybe there was a drain. I don't know. Ew. But right. either way... I regret asking. I know. <laughs> I knew. I knew you were going to ask, and um, I looked everywhere, and Yeah. So, uh, so he goes to the basement to, uh, use the restroom, discovers the body of Mary Fagan, who's 13 years old. Oh. She was an employee at the pencil factory. Child labor laws didn't exist. Yeah, we'll get to that too. So she's near the incinerator on a pile of sawdust. Oh. Her dress is pulled up around her waist. Oh no. Um, she's covered in so much dirt that when the, that she's completely unrecognizable. And when the police first get there, they think, oh, it's this little black girl. <gasps> but she wasn't. She was white. They pulled back her stocking and then they could see like her skin. But the rest That's of her was just covered sad. in soot. From And there was a big incinerator in the basement. And so I think it was just filthy yeah. down there. Um she had a scratched face, which mm-hmm. becomes really important later. She was bruised. Her head was battered and matted with blood in her hair. Mm-hmm. She had blood on her petticoat and her underwear, mm-hmm. um, which were also slit open, and her dress was slit open, too. She mm-hmm. had a rope around her neck that was buried into her flesh a quarter of an inch. <sighs> And so that she, they Dang. pretty quickly determined that's how she died. Mm-hmm. And um, she also had two notes with her that they call them the murder notes. Mm-hmm. And both of them were supposedly written by her pointing the blame for her murder at the night watchman, Newt Lee, who's the guy that found her. Mm-hmm. Okay. But that we're going to come back to that later too, because it ends up being kind of weird. Mm-hmm. So Mary had gone to pick up her last paycheck and then she was going to go meet her family at the Confederate Memorial Day Parade. And of course, she never made it there. She went to pick up her paycheck and that was the last time anyone ever saw her. So a little background on Mary. She was born June 1st, 1899. Her father died before she was born. When she was 10 years old, she had to drop out of school to take a job in a textile mill. Um, and then in 1912, so a couple years later, her mom got remarried and they moved and she got a job operating the machine that puts the erasers on pencils okay. at the National Pencil Company. Oh. So I know you're dying to know. Uh-huh. Um, that's called a knurling machine. A knurling. And it sticks the erasers in the ferrule, which is the metal piece yeah. of the pencil. That's cool. She earned a whopping 10 cents an hour. Oh. Uh. Yeah. And she worked on the second floor, which is also important because it's right across the hall from the director. So, like, the guy that ran the plant. His name is Leo Frank. It's right across the hall from his office. Mm. So, an investigation takes place. And the very first people they arrest are one of Mary's friends, which the, we don't really know a whole lot about that person or why they were a suspect. And then also Newt Lee, the night watchman who discovered her yeah. body and who was basically, like, his name wasn't in the notes, but, but it, it described him. him. Yeah. Well, they released them really early on, and the police realize that the scene in the basement is has been staged oh. because there's not 
like the blood isn't there. Up on the second floor, they discover um, a lathe, like a tool with blood and hair on it. And they discover mm-hmm. blood on the floor. Um, there are drag marks that are coming, like, from the elevator over to where they find Mary's body, which is how they think she got all the scratches on her face. Because the scratches on her face didn't bleed. So they were made post-mortem. Mm-hmm. And the... The thought was that whoever did it dragged her through all the dirt in the basement to look like there had been a struggle in the basement, and that's where she was killed. But really, they were pretty sure she was killed up on the second floor. So they call Leo Frank, because he's the boss, and he comes in, he meets them there, and he's like really nervous. Mm -hmm. And so he just doesn't, like, there's not a whole lot of confidence in him right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And at first... They ask him about Mary, and he says that he he doesn't know who she is, and he'd have to look at the employment logs and, like, the Mm -hmm. payroll and stuff. Like, she's just a kid in his factory, and he doesn't know her. Um, But later, after he talks to his lawyer and they, like, plot out a timeline, he does say that he saw her sometime between 12.05 and 12.10, the day that she was murdered, because she came to pick up her paycheck. Oh, yeah. Um. And he also, in giving that account, says that Lee, the night watchman who'd found the body, arrived around four, which is significant because eventually they place the time of death, uh, like, between 12, 12, 15, somewhere in there. Mm. So according to the boss, to Leo Frank, Lee wasn't even in the building when she was murdered. Um, And he saw her, like, right before. So... During the interview, they're kind of suspicious of him, and so they have him take off all his clothes and prove that he doesn't have any injuries, like any defensive wounds or anything on his body, and he doesn't, and they ask him for yesterday's suit, and he produces it, and it doesn't have any blood on it either, Mm. so, I mean, no blood, so he's looking kind of innocent, but he's still, like, super nervous. They go to his house. I'm sorry. No, they don't. They go to Lee's house, the night watchman's house. Yeah. And they find a burn barrel, and in the burn barrel, there's a bloody shirt. And so it's like he was going to burn his clothes. But they inspect it, and they say there are a couple things that were just off. Like, for one thing, where the blood was on the shirt, it was, like, all up in the armpits and in really weird places. Like, somebody had just smeared the blood on it, not like it had been worn during a murder. Uh. And the other thing is, they said it didn't smell worn. Which, I mean, I guess early 1900s in the factory, like, you would know. Plus, you know, he's the night watchman. He's not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's not wearing a suit and tie and and trying to impress anybody. So they decide it's an obvious plant, and they pretty quickly come to the conclusion that Leo Frank did it. Mm -hmm. That he put the shirt in the burn barrel in order to implicate, to further implicate Lee. So they arrest Frank because he seems suspicious and he's the last person that admits to seeing her alive. Yeah. And they believed that he and Lee conspired and that Lee helped by staging the scene in the basement and then Frank tried to pin it all on him. Oh. Uh, A witness said, told the police that Mary had told him that Frank had flirted with her and made her uncomfortable and there were some other women that came forward and said, oh yeah, he made advances at me and blah, blah, blah. And so it was a little bit creepy and... Um, and then there's some stuff in Frank's background that also really turned the tide against him. It didn't make him look guilty, but at the time, like it really sort of solidified. Uh, so he was born in 1884. So he was 29 at the time of the murder Mm -hmm. and he was Jewish, which is pretty significant because, um, at the time it wasn't that Georgia was particularly anti-Semitic. It was just that they were sort of starting to lean that way, mostly because they were concerned about the child labor that was being used in different factories, and they pretty much either connected those factories to people that were Jewish or, like, Uh. said, oh, they were all, you know, they just blamed. Mm -hmm. They chose somebody and blamed him. Mm -hmm. Um, He... So he was Jewish, and that was really against him. He had his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, and he apprenticed at a pencil manufacturing plant. Uh, So they go to court, and the chief witness against him is the janitor, who is a man named Jim Conley. Mm -hmm. And he's a black man, which becomes really important because he's a black man that accuses a white man. And uh, they eventually, the prosecution pretty much bases their case on his testimony. Oh, okay. So he was an early suspect, but they decided early on that he didn't do it because he... um, 
he confessed. Well, because for one thing, because they really thought Frank did it from the very beginning. Yeah. And for another thing, he, he confessed to like parts of the crime, but had an alternate version of the story. So he could read and write and they noticed some sim- similar spelling patterns when they had him write things to the notes. The notes. Oh. And so they interviewed him. Mm-hmm. And at first he said, yeah, I wrote the notes because Friday night, so the murder happened Saturday morning. Friday night, Frank, the boss, called me into his office and he said, here, write this down. And he told me what to say and I wrote it down. And then I left. Hmm. And they were like, that doesn't really make sense because that makes it seem like Frank, who we're pretty sure did it, like knew ahead of time and he was already concocting this scheme. And yeah. So they interview him again and he says, oh no, I, I lied about the meeting date. Actually, it was the day of the murder, but I didn't know anything about the murder. So it was like sometime Saturday he called me into his office and he had me write these notes and I didn't know what it was for, but he gave me some cigarettes and, um, and sent me on my way. Freaking cheap. Yeah. Uh. So, yeah. Mm. That satisfied the police. Oh they were like, God. okay, that sounds plausible. I hate the police. Well, not really, <laughs> but these guys. Right. You gotta, you have to like the police, because if anybody ever steals your toys... I know, those are the ones I gotta call. That's right. Ugh. They're the ones who can put the bad guys in cages. In cages, and serve them nasty food. And serve them nasty food next to other bad guys, which oh. I think was the most traumatizing yeah. part. <laughs> So some of the higher ups in the company were not convinced and they went to the papers and they were like, yeah, this is, this doesn't make any sense. So they interview him again. And this time he says that Frank confessed to him. He said, I picked up a girl back there and let her fall. She hit her head and she died. And so then Frank gave him $200 to help hide the body, to pay him to help hide the body. And they hid the body They went down the elevator, which was an important part of his story, and they hid the body. And then Frank took the money back and said that he would give it back to him if he could get through the weekend without being arrested. Like, as long as I'm still out of jail by Monday, you can have the money back. So, I guess holding it over his head like a bribe. I don't know. Uh. But then, he said... That actually, he'd been given the money to burn Mary's body, but when he got down there, he refused to do it. So that's why Frank took the money back. So okay. his story just keeps, keeps changing, changing and keeps mm-hmm. changing and keeps changing. So uh, the big, there were two big issues in this case that sort of decided how things ended up, and they end up so tragically. Uh, okay. One is the media coverage, because the media was just all over this. And it was a big scandal. They posted, like, rewards for information. There was just tons of coverage. And so a lot of things that were just sort of rumor got printed as fact, and then they became fact, and everybody Uh. read it and saw it. And the other thing was, of course, race. Because on the one hand, you've got Frank, who's white, but he's Jewish, and Mm -hmm. feelings of the time were kind of starting to go against that. Um, But he's also really powerful, and he's the director of the company. And then on the other hand, you have Conley, who's just a janitor, and he's black. Mm -hmm. And so the defense argued that Conley, who the janitor, was degraded and dangerous, and he was a monster, and he's the one that really did it, and Mm -hmm. all of that. The prosecutor painted him as this, like, nice old harmless black man who, yeah. you know, was, you know, whatever. And since they were in Georgia in the early 1900s, the jurors actually believed that version of him more, but not because they had any affinity for black people, but because they figured that a black man wasn't smart enough to make up such complicated lies, so he must be telling the truth. Oh, my God. Yep. Yeah. So, the prosecutor's Ugh. version of events was pretty much just exactly what Conley's was. Mm-hmm. Um, Frank killed her, and then he uh, told me that he killed her. And actually, his story changes a little bit more once they get into court. But he told me he killed her. He told me I had to help move the body. I helped move the body. He did or didn't pay me based on, you know, what I did or didn't do. Mm-hmm. And at the end. And then she was found, and that's that. Uh, The defense, on the other hand, I thought their case was just sort of bizarre. So they had some really good points, but their sort of alternate theory of the crime left a lot to be desired, which I think didn't help their case. So they did talk about the drag marks, and they said that Conley would have had... would. 
could have carried um, Mary down the ladder and then dragged her across the floor to make it look like a struggle, to make it look like she'd come from the elevator or whatever. Um, they did call a bunch of witnesses who proved that Frank couldn't possibly have had the time to kill her mm -hmm. because they saw him right before and right after and there was no time in between for him to go down to the basement mm -hmm. or murder somebody, take him down to the basement and yeah. stage this whole crime. And they also talked a lot about Mary's purse and money was missing and it was never found. And Frank's house was searched right away and they didn't find it there. Mm. Um, at one point, Connolly says, oh, well, I saw him lock it in the safe. So they make Frank open up the safe and it's also not there. Yeah. So their point is, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't you have found it? Which, not necessarily, but at the same time, Conley didn't have a good answer for that either. And he said it was definitely in one place and it wasn't. Yeah. And so. um, but their theory of the crime was that Conley killed her and that Newt Lee, the guy the, that was originally implicated, okay. helped him write the notes <laughs> that implicated him and in him the murder. Do, that made no sense to me whatsoever. Like, quick, write this down. A dashing man. Right. What? Like, <laughs> what? No, shut up. Right, wait, wait, are you describing me? <laughs> yeah. So both sides talked about Frank's, like, sexual advances on women, and mm. the defense produced a bunch of witnesses that said he was a perfect gentleman, and the prosecution produced a bunch of witnesses that said he came on to me, and so that was never really yeah. decided. And so they convict Frank and sentenced him to death by hanging. Oh, my God. They have no evidence whatsoever leaning any way. And they just pick just a man to kill him. one guy who says he did it and admits that he was also there and helped cover it up. So, yeah, that was that was it. But Dang. they had decided from the moment that they called him in when he was all nervous. It's an inside job. Someone was like, get rid of him. Yeah, well, so it turns out pretty much the entire state of Georgia. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, a couple years later, 1915, uh the attorneys go to Governor Slayton at the time, Governor of Georgia, and they give him all these documents and all of these requests, and they're like, you know, you have to review this case. You have to pardon him. Like, he, he didn't do it. And he does end up deciding that he doesn't, he's no longer sentenced to death. He commutes his um, sentence to life in prison. So among the documents, there were 10,000 pages of documents that he had to review. Jesus. There was a note from the original judge right before his death saying, please correct my mistake and set things right. And this should never have happened. Yeah. Oh, my God. And in the end, there were two pieces of evidence that Slayton really looked at. One of them was the elevator, and the other one was the murder notes. So here's the part about the bathroom. Okay. Okay. So when Mary was found, for whatever reason, they looked in the elevator shaft. And at the bottom of the elevator shaft was, as they called it, a pile of excrement Ew. that was not crushed. It was totally undisturbed. Like somebody shat in the elevator and or shaft, and it, it was just there. And okay. Conley said, oh, well, that was me. Because apparently that's just totally okay. I don't know. <laughs> that's why it made me wonder if there was really a bathroom, a bathroom down there or, or if they, they were just go to the bathroom down there. Right. Gotcha. Right. He said, oh, that was me. It was from this morning. You know, it was like the morning before the murder, before the body was discovered, all that. And they said, well, then if you and Frank then covered up the murder Frank committed by carrying the body down in the elevator, wouldn't it be, like, smashed? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, no, the elevator, you know, you can stop it anywhere. It doesn't always hit the bottom, blah, blah, blah. Well, they ran a bunch of tests on it, and they talked to people, and they even had talked to him about it, and he had said that, in fact, every time the elevator goes down to the basement, it hits the floor, and that's how it stops. And that, that they was. proved that's what happened, and so... It would have been smashed poo instead of intact poo. What a weird poo. thing to use. Right? Weird. But at least these detectives are trying. Right. I like it. Well, somebody was trying, and Slayton yeah. at least looked at it, like, yeah. cared about it. Um, so he said that, so that cast doubt on that part of Conley's story, and why was he lying about yeah. that, and anyway... And the second thing he said was that the murder notes, which I didn't copy them down because I didn't want to have to read them out loud because I would never have been able to read them Aww. out loud. They're, they're so illiterate and confusing and mm -hmm. I don't even know really 
what they meant. I mean, apparently like, people at the time were able to understand. Yeah. Like, them. was it just like slang or something? It was, it was really okay. bizarre. The other thing about them is they were written in third person. So it wasn't as if Mary were writing them, which Slayton was like, wouldn't she have written from, this is the person who killed me, not this is the person who killed her. Mm-hmm. Right. So that was really weird. Um, and then they also they had very strange vocabulary. So there were tons of spelling mistakes and mm-hmm. tons of like misused words. And like instead of calling him the night watchman, they called him the night witch or like oh. wrote it out as night witch and thought yeah. that's how you spell watchman. And um, when he looked back over all of um, Conley, <laughs> when he looked back over all of Conley's like testimony and written things, he noticed that the misspellings were the same and like he would combine like long lists of adjectives in weird ways. Like oh. in the note, he called him the, the long, tall, slim, Negro, something, night witch or whatever. And it was just this like long list of, of things yeah. to describe him. Cause they didn't ever name the night watchman. They just described him. And so he used the same, like, speech patterns and the same, oh, like, written okay. things. So he said that was, it really sounded like it was maybe written by him, but not just written by him, which he admitted, but also, like, created by him. Yeah. That, first of all, Frank was an educated man who wouldn't have made the mistake of writing in third person. And secondly, it wasn't his voice, so it wasn't like he dictated it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, this pissed everybody in Georgia off. <laughs> Every single person. That's funny. And so they knew that was going to happen. So the night before they announced it, they secretly moved Frank from wherever he was in prison in Georgia to, Georgia to the Midgeville State Penitentiary because it was like a converted barracks. And so it was mm. really heavily guarded and they thought he'd be safer there. Yeah. And then they announced it. Of course, everybody was all up in arms and they were really pissed. And the newspapers said, you know, sending him to this other state penitentiary didn't help because one of his fellow inmates actually slashed his throat and cut (gasps) one of his arteries um, with a butcher's knife. Because apparently it's cool to give inmates butcher's knives. Also, how the hell did he get that? I don't know. Well, uh, he said that he did it because he figured he would be pardoned, that everybody would be so happy that he'd done it, that if he had managed to kill him, kill Frank, which he didn't. But if he'd managed to kill Leo Frank, they would have, they would let him out. Everyone really hates this guy. They do. And it seems to be nothing he's done personally, but it's just that he's Jewish and he's in a position of power and everybody felt really helpless and they didn't like him. A group formed, so January, or excuse me, June 21st was the date of commutation, 1915. So that's when they reduced his sentence. And this group formed that very night called the Knights of Mary Fagan. Mm. And they were 28 men from all different professions who got together and like vowed to avenge her. Like, they didn't feel like this was fair and not enough punishment had been dealt out. And so they wanted to make sure that Frank got his original sentence. Oh, my God. So on August 16th, they drove eight cars out to the prison. They broke in. Broke into the prison. They broke into the prison. And this I'm going to read straight from, like, the Wikipedia page because it was kind of amazing. It says they arrived at the prison around 10 p.m. The electrician cut the telephone wires. Members of the group drained the gas from the prison's automobiles. They handcuffed the warden. They seized Frank. And they drove away. It was a 175-mile trip that took about seven hours at a top speed of 18 miles an hour, which is what they would have done on small in small towns back roads. Yeah. And they had lookouts in the towns that would, like, the telephone head to the next town when they saw the cars go past. Yeah. So, like, it was this huge... Well thought out, well carried out yeah. plan. Dang. So they break in, break in, they kidnap Frank, they hang him. Aww. They actually, they beat him up, they do a whole bunch of terrible things to him, and then they finally, they hang him um, facing the direction of Mary Fagan's home. And um, then they take his body down and they just beat it up. They stomp it, they throw things at it. It's just awful. Mm. So they finally send the body off to, to a funeral home. Mm. Apparently, all of the the people, it said that in Atlanta, they it was he was at the undertaker's parlor, right? Like what was oh, left okay. of his body after they had destroyed it. Yeah. And 
thousands of people came and they just sort of laid siege to this parlor and they were like, we want to see the body. You have to let us in. You can't keep us out here. And finally they started like throwing bricks at the windows. And so they were allowed to come in and look at him. Dang. That's yeah. Ew, I wouldn't want to. They just wanted to see him dead. They just hated him so much. They wanted to see him Ugh, dead. I can't imagine that. I, it's, it's like a mob mentality or something. Yeah. It's insane. So the follow-up is, so then he was dead. You know, story's over. Conley did get one year in jail for helping Frank to move the body. Only a year. Just a year. That's all he got. In 1982, so decades later, this man named Alonzo Mann, who was an office boy at the time, uh, one of Frank's office boys, Mm -hmm. like a runner or whatever, said that um, he talked to some reporters and he said that at the time he had not said anything because he was afraid and his mom told him not to, but he had seen Conley carrying... Mary's body toward the ladder that led down to the basement and that, you know, he knew that she, he had killed Mary and like Aww. that, the whole like defense's case about going down the ladder and dragging her across. That was all true. And he said that Conley had seen him and threatened him and said he would kill him. And he went home and told his mom and his mom was like, well, don't get involved. And so he never said anything. Aww. And then in 1982, he was like on his deathbed and he was like, okay, so I, you know, I've told some friends and family and now I just have to get this oh, off my chest before I die. So, and then in 1986, a group went to the Georgia State Board of Pardons and Paroles and tried to get him sort of posthumously pardoned. Hmm. And they didn't pardon him, but after a second appeal, they did agree that um, to admit that the state had failed to protect Frank and that we could never really know the truth because he hadn't lived long enough to really get a fair trial. Uh, yeah. So. Oh, my God. Yeah. More... Cops and detectives and judge and legal system not doing what I need them to do. Yeah. Um, unsurprisingly, later, a bunch of the Knights of Mary Fagan joined the KKK. Ah. Uh, surprise, surprise, because they were really upstanding citizens. Mm-hmm. There were rewards offered for information on who had actually committed the murder of Frank, of Leo Frank, and people would, like, go on record saying, well, I know who it is, but I'm not going to tell you because I agree with them, and I would never uh, give them that and so it just it is seems very such mobby. a hateful yeah. story. Not to very poorly segue into my story, but it kind of has to do with female lady parts. Oh, great. I mean, yeah. I guess we covered the eating of penises in our, like, second episode. So. Yeah. Either way. No so, turning back now, right? I know. This is definitely not safe for work content, guys. So no. if you're little kids listening to this, go away. <laughs> right? It's too late to turn it off now, but turn it off anyway. Oh my gosh, it was our fifth episode that we talked about that. No. Yeah. Because it wasn't his name Armin or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Fifth episode. Wow. You know, this is our ninth episode. Next one is ten. Shit. Ten. I'm missing stuff from my list. (laughs) You are. You're missing only one thing, though. Yeah, that's true. Just the last one, which accidentally came out a day early. Surprise. You're all welcome. (laughs) 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 Woohoo! I don't know dates, and I don't use a calendar. (laughs) And <laughs> so. well, that's all right. Okay, are you ready for mine? I am so ready. Please bear with me as I'm going to take breaks to take tea. Just keep my throat hot so I can talk. <laughs> so I <coughs> pulled a name out of one of the articles I read to list mine, and I named it the Love Surgeon. I am not happy about that. No, you should not be. I'm already very unhappy about that. Little background story. Oh, God. So this is about James C. Burt. I pronounced all those names right. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like none of them maybe were over five letters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oops. No, I mean, way to go, Jordan. Yeah. So, um... He was born in 1921, so kind of oh, like... Oh, chose like older Oh, yeah, I know. Awesome. That's why when you were saying, I was like... <gasps> but mine was in Dayton, Ohio. Oh, yeah, so, not the same place. Nope. Um, he earned his MD from the University of Rochester School of Medicine, and that was in 45. Then he was licensed in 1951. Shortly after getting li- his license, he opened up his own practice, which was an OBGYN. Oh, yeah, I really don't like where this is going. Yep. 
<laughs> so <laughs> that was a terrifying look you just, just gave me too. Yeah, I'll say in just a little um snippet, he started what we're gonna find out what it is, the love surgery. He started those in nineteen sixty six. Oh, no. So. Oh, no, 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 no. His practice, they had sole focuses, so they were not like a normal one you go to today that they just kind of cover all the bases. Right. He had sole focuses for his, and it was mostly the um, nature of human sexual response, treating sexual dysfunctions and disorders, and the clitoris. And that was it. That was all he would treat. Okay, so he he was an OBGYN, but not so much an OB. But he eventually realizes to do what he wants to do, he has to be an OB. So he starts delivering This is like Frankenstein shit. I don't like this at all. (laughs) But his thing, we'll touch back on the whole childbirth thing in a little bit, but um, he believed that women's bodies were not properly aligned for, I hate this word, (laughs) penetrative sex. I hate the penetrate. <laughs> like, no, nah, I could have reason to use the word penetrate. <laughs> so, that, I mean, too. yes, that's all I could think of. Oh. Um, so he thought that it was not um, that their bodies were not right for a man, and that was his thought process. That it yeah, was not that right. Makes total sense. Yeah, he's like that. It's not right for heterosexual sex, sexual, like any type of intercourse. It's just not right for the man. That makes no sense whatsoever. And what <laughs> what would it be right for them? What would be the purpose of the shape I was of woman's say, body? Say like I don't get it. Evolutionarily, so. it has to be made for reproduction. Yeah, but he didn't think it was aligned right. So, so basically, what we're saying is like he was a micro penis man or something, and he was. We'll really touch upset. on that too. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's when he decided that he was going to pretty much plan out a surgery that could fix this problem. Uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah, um, so... I thought he was involved in feminine, what was it, sexual pleasure at what? Um, the nature of human sexual response, but he was also treating sexual dysfunctions and disorders, which he pretty much labeled this as a dysfunction. So every single woman in the world has a sexual dysfunction, which is that she's shaped wrong for a guy. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, This is upsetting to me. (laughs) Yep, it made me so mad when I was writing it. Um, so he wanted... His plan, like he schemed it all out for his surgery, what he would do for women was move the clitoris down. Mm -mm. He, after childbirth, he would do these. That's why he started delivering babies because um, he would, he was not happy with women's vaginal openings after they have child. Or like after, like, yep. And he, to quote him, which just made me so mad, that it was large enough to drive a truck through sideways. Ew! Yep. What an asshole! Yep. Okay, he totally has a micropenis. So, he said, you know, after childbirth that he would do, um, do these surgeries to pretty much help shrink that, move the clitoris down, and like, oh, well, I'll read you the whole list of his thing after he, um figures it all out. So he ends up writing a book in 75, just kind of skip a little ahead, um, called Surgery of Love, stating that he could change women into horny little mice. (laughs) This is, are you ready for like the most offensive thing in the world? I thought I had already heard it. No, 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 (laughs) no. So this is straight out of his book, which he ended up having to self-publish because because no no one else, they were like, no, these are barbaric. Like, have you done this on anyone? He's like, no, they're just ideas. But at the time, yes, he had. So he self-published it. But um, one of his quotes is, the difference between rape and rapture is the salesmanship. (gasps) I, isn't he the worst person in the world? Oh my God. He should have had a mob coming after him <laughs> in jail to string him right? up. Right? Oh. So he had been practicing these surgeries between 1954 to 66. He had Unwilling victims? So I think it was like 98% were unknowing because they oh. had either like gone there for... Oh, something that they were sold, like, right. oh no, your sex life will be great after I do this. Right. Oh, okay. But then he went in and did ten times more of what he actually right. said. Or after childbirth. And they didn't know. And they didn't know. And he, they said that he um, was known to be heavy-handed on the anesthesia. Oh my gosh. So, He's such a monster. This is, a, these are the four things, like I've noted, noted down four things that he put in his um, pretty much everyday routine for all these surgeries. That he would use more stitches to make the vaginal opening smaller. 
his reason was so every man could love his woman to exhaustion. Okay, so yeah. He has a micro penis. Yeah, he's got to yeah. be. So I was like, uh-huh. And um, he'd move, remove the clitoris hood. No. Nope. And move it down. Oh. And angle pretty much everything straight up. So that there would be more friction? Yeah. He said, it's for you. It's for the women. Like, this would be greater for you. I mean, I... Uh... Like, I understand, but I don't want to, but it's, like, sad. But these women either thought, like, oh, okay, you'll do this and I'll have a better love life. Or, oh, you'll do this and my husband will be more satisfied. Right. You know, and, ugh. So, he, come to find out, he wasn't even a surgeon. What? Like, he did not have any qualifications for, like, no, that's all. (laughs) He did not have But he did, he was actually a doctor. But, Yes. Okay. But he performed over 4,500 surgeries. Oh, my God. By the mid-70s. That's, like... The mid-70s is not so long ago that those people, they're, they're just still around. And they're oh, still yeah. relatively young. And they're still mutilated. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. So, he ended up... Like, I, it didn't talk a whole lot about his personal life. But he ended up being married four times. Yeah, no surprise. Yeah, the fourth wife was actually a co-author of his book... Oh, my God. Um, she was, like, the star example saying how after she had the surgery that everything was great and their love life was amazing and they're so happy and blah, blah, blah. Like, ugh, you're literally possessed. I was going to um, say, he finally found one stupid enough to go right? along with it. So, by the 70s, because he released the book in 75. I'm just making sure I said that right. Yeah. I think that's what you said. Yeah. yeah. So, by... um. By, like, the late 70s, after, like, he got an article written about him, his book had released, he was on a TV show, like, a talk show about it. Before this point, people didn't know that he had been practicing, pretty much, on people who didn't know, like, what was going on with them. So, um, women were, like, flocking to him, like, can you fix me, like, save our marriage, like, oh my gosh. And (laughs) most every one of his patients didn't. It didn't work out, obviously, but right. um, they ended up getting infections, kidney and bladder infections. Um, oh, my gosh. Uh, sexually dysfunctional, like, literally, they like, physically could not have sex. Like, it was not yeah. possible. Right. Um, and not all their husbands they are needed, as tiny as him. Yeah. And they needed, um, I know one needed minimum of three corrective surgeries to fix everything to the point where she just kind of gave up. He would tell people, or tell women, um, you know, like, after they had a baby, in order to do his surgery, he was just, like, wanted to keep experimenting, pretty much. He's yeah. like, well, let's just do a hysterectomy. And he was like, why? And like, well, you don't need any more kids. And kind of just made decisions for these ladies. And, yeah. I was like, you motherfucker. So. Oh, my gosh. So, after all of his press came the bad press, too. Right, because then people... All of the malpractice lawsuits came forward because they didn't realize that there were so many other women feeling the same thing. Everyone was really embarrassed and like, sure. well, I asked for this, but no, that's not what they asked for, really. Right. Um, so they would, um, let's see, it was like Waves 33 said that they never opted for that type, that surgery. So out of all of these, 33 definitely said, well, I didn't think I was getting any surgery. So they, they probably had their baby, thought a few stitches is normal. Right. And that was it. But they didn't realize what actually had what happened. Happens after you have a baby is yeah. everything's all messed up. So they were like, well, we never opted for a surgery. So in December 1988, the Ohio State Medical Board charged him with 41 violations. And obviously he knew he was going to be convicted because there were so many people against him. Right. And he, like, wrote a book about it. Like, you're an right. idiot. <laughs> so, um... He confessed in writing. The next month, so January uh, 1989, he surrenders his license because he knows they're going to take it away from him anyways. So then he ended up getting divorced, which I didn't really touch on a whole lot. And I'm like, you co-author, wife, whatever right. you are, like, oh, now she you're going to divorce. She was her own skin. Yeah. Or she was, like, horribly abused and finally yeah. some courage or Probably. <laughs> so, um, he ended up having to file bankruptcy. With the victims of malpractice lawsuits totaling in over $21 million. 
He didn't go to jail, but that means that his victims didn't even get compensated. Like, not that that would have made anything made, better. Yeah. But a lot of them had to get corrective surgeries. So it really would so have So it would have helped them out. Um, I know a lot of people, they were saying that some people um, either ended up resulting in divorce or um, to the point where they couldn't even have sex again. Like, a lot of emotional... But, um, uh, yeah, because I wouldn't want oh, anyone here to ever touch me ever again. I forgot about this. My pen died. I was going to touch back on this, but I forgot. But, um, some of, there were some quotes from the victims as far oh. as like what I said, it, this is the one she said, the way I was deformed, I couldn't even have sex. I ended up going through three different corrective surgeries. Um, she said, and then another one, you're raised to trust your minister, your policeman, and your doctor. When yeah. he's the one with the degree on the wall, he knew medicine better than I did. I didn't think he would hurt me. I was like, you poor thing. Um, she said, and then another one says, I don't know why he would do that unless he hates women. But uh, someone said, I thought that I would die. The pain was unlike anything I'd ever experiences in places I couldn't understand. And then one said, right now, I feel like I've been raped. Which is like, uh, uh, yeah, pretty oh, much, yeah. yeah. Somebody took a scalpel to your lady bits, that counts. Yep, but in on the trial, I this is another thing I was trying to write, but my pen fucking died. But I'm still <laughs> real upset about that. Pen. I know, I need the same exact <laughs> one because then you know, I like have such a thing that I will not write in this notebook until you get that until pen. I get that pen because that's the same pen through the notebook. Well, the good news is you said you tweeted a picture of the pen, I did, and you sent me a picture of the pen. I know. So we know what pen it is. Yeah. The you know pen what, has guys? been identified. We have a Patreon account. Uh, Buy Jordan a new pen. <laughs> I'm sure. I will I'll handcraft you something if you send me that pen. Um, I usually do cupcakes, but I can't do that via the mail. So I mean, you um, could. Just nobody would want to eat them on the other end. <laughs> that's true. They'd be like, Of course, oh. after this story, nobody ever wants to eat again anyway. Oh, that's true. Um, the last um, article... Uh, part about the article, whatever I'm trying to say. The last paragraph in this article was talking about how his son, which I didn't even realize he had kids, um, spoke on his behalf and was, like, defending him. I'm like, kid. No. <sighs> no. So, uh, he, but the doctor, um, Bert, he maintained his innocence and blamed his situation on unjustified crucifixion and a, and a, an avalanche of yellow journalism. My med- he said, my medical practice has been conducted with great concern for the welfare of women. No, actually it hasn't. No. Um, there were a lot of women with problems involving vaginal intercourse that were either not being uh, adequately addressed or not being addressed at all. He's 91. In 2012, he was 91. So he's probably dead. He's probably. Um... He didn't even get to go to jail and, like... Mm-hmm. I don't know. Have someone make him his bitch. Right. <laughs> That's how I wanted this story to end. I know. I still don't know where he is. I guess he just had to give up his license and then just... Now he's just a normal Joe. I don't know. I am just... Ugh, I guess I'm probably glad that I don't know what happened to him after he declared bankruptcy. Because he could have become president or... <sighs> I... Uh... <sighs> Well, thanks. I know. All right. Um, well, I have to go to my gyno tomorrow for an ultrasound, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I really hope that they don't give you love surgery. I hope not. Or any kind of surgery. This is an ultrasound, so if they're like, here's just a little anesthesia, I'm like, um, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can be awake. <laughs> right? I'll take I'm, it. I'm good with this. Ultrasound, okay. not painful. Yep. Not comfortable. Mm-hmm. Not painful. Do you want to state for the record that you're not pregnant? That's oh, not why yeah. you're going. No, I'm not. It's my cyst <laughs> from episode whatever <laughs> with Poor Mike. Jordan. So they have to check and make sure that they're gone. Do you feel better? Well, now it's in my throat, so I think the pain's just like, I don't feel that pain anymore, and now it's just I feel my throat on fire. You just needed to rest more and yeah. not go to your job. and Three weeks. I know. <laughs> and then I'll be a full-time podcaster. Dog, well, dog mom is what I was going to say. <laughs> See, our, our podcast is so successful that Jordan has quit her <laughs> job yeah, guys, to do this full-time. We need those listens now. <laughs> right. Also, if I haven't mentioned, we have a Patreon yes. account. <laughs> Check our Facebook. That's right. Okay, well, I have one more very short story because we talked, well, I talked a lot this Me episode. Me too. I feel like I did. Yeah. But it's just hurt, so I feel like I did. Well, you just have to 
like gasp a little bit or some I don't know. Mm-hmm. Laugh. I'm not really sure. We'll see. <gasps> so here, just it, edit that in where you need it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get some sound effects. <laughs> So, last week, I talked about the Watcher House yes. in New Jersey. which I brought up to Mike, and he's like, oh, I know that. Yeah. Because, like, I mean, obviously it was around, but he was like, oh, I know about that. And he kind of, like, was telling me. I was like, yeah, that's it. I had a dream about it. Like, I, it's been, really? like, super stuck in my head, apparently, Weird. since last week. Well, so this week, this one is, it was linked in the same article. It's not really related to the Watcher House, but it okay. took place around the same time, and it... Nope, I lied. It took place. <laughs> it took place during part of the history of the Watcher House because that was okay. like 1920s to 2015. Okay. This was 1970s, okay. but it was very nearby. It was like less than three miles away, um, and it um, it may be influenced sort of the the story, like the area had sort of a bad reputation because of this actual true crime that definitely happened. Oh. Um, which is is about John List. So John List, he was a deeply religious accountant. Like I said, lived very close to, like, three, less than three miles away from the Watcher House. Um, and in 1971, he shot and killed his mother, hmm. who was 84, oh and lived upstairs in their house. His wife, who was 45, and their three kids, 16, 15, and 13. Oh, my God. Yeah. So they lived in an 18 room mansion. Oh. And, oh. right. Okay. What? Well, like, and the Watcher House was super nice, too. Like, this is apparently a great area, except that people keep getting murdered yeah, and spied so they keep on. Yeah, going crazy. Yeah. So they live in this 18 room mansion. And when they found out what he had done, he had taken all the bodies downstairs and he laid them in a row in the room that they called the ballroom. Mm-hmm. And, um,. There was music playing. It was like a spooky scene. So, all right, let me get back. So, his motive for killing everybody, there were two. There was the one he said, and then there was the one that was probably the truth. So, the one that he said, he actually left a note with all of these bodies. It was a note to his pastor saying that the 1970s were a terribly corrupt time, and he was worried about his family's souls, and he thought that if he killed them now, they wouldn't have a chance to be tempted by this horrible, sinful time, so they would definitely get to go to heaven, and so he was, like, doing them a favor by killing them before they could screw things up. The real reason is that, oh, he was especially saving his daughter who wanted to be an actress, which he thought was particularly sinful and horrible, and apparently she was really talented. Um, his real reason is that he was under a lot of financial stress, mostly from his huge ass house that yeah. he couldn't afford. And apparently his wife, this isn't funny, <laughs> his wife oh. had, um, medical bills from mental illness because she had advanced syphilis, which causes oh. all sorts of mental issues. Dang. Um, and that was also, you know, weighing on him financially. And so... He killed them. After he killed them, he tried to cover it up. He wrote letters to their schools and the kids' part-time jobs explaining that the family had gone on vacation and they wouldn't be there for a while. He called the post office and stopped the mail. He stopped the milk and newspaper deliveries, and he left town. So as far as anyone could tell, the family had gone on vacation and like did all the normal things you do when you go on vacation and everything was yeah. fine. So no one even discovered the bodies for a month. Oh, my God. So after a month, the drama teacher of the daughter um, decided that he just wasn't really buying this gone out of town thing anymore. And he couldn't get any answers from anybody as to where they were when they were coming back. Mm -hmm. So he thought he would go to the house and see if he could figure anything out because they weren't answering the phones. Well, the neighbors saw him going to the house and I guess like maybe looking in the windows or something. And they decided he was there to rob the place. Mm. So they called the cops on the drama teacher. And when the cops arrived, they forced open a window because he, you know, he explained that we haven't seen them. Like, this is really weird. It's been a month. And they were hit with this smell. Oh, I'm sure. And so they broke into the house and they heard music. And they followed the music down the hall. The music had been playing for a month? Yes. How? And I... I, Spooky. I don't know. It was like organ music. It was like creepy music. I, I mean, it probably wasn't creepy. It was probably a hymn or something. But I'm sure creepy it was super in, creepy in this. Yeah. So, follow the music down the hall, they get to the ballroom, and they find four bodies covered in cloth, which in some reports were, like, 
at first they just thought it was like laundry or something on the floor. They didn't realize they were people, but that's where the smell was coming from. And they found the note to the pastor. Um, and it basically, you know, it gave his whole, it's a sinful time, blah, blah, blah. And it also said, my mom is upstairs. She was too heavy to carry down here. So she's upstairs in her room and they found her upstairs covered with another blanket. And, um, she was too heavy. She was too heavy to carry downstairs. And then for 18 years after discovering these bodies, no progress whatsoever was made on the case. Oh. Because he'd had a month to disappear and he'd left and changed his name and moved away and had started his life yeah. over again. Because apparently, like, the 1970s were too sinful and dangerous for, you know, his children and his. But he can 84 go year old and mom, but he's cool. Hole. I mean, I guess at that point he'd committed mm. murder, so there was no hope. I don't know. I don't, he's crazy. Um, so 18 years, no progress was made. And then America's Most Wanted, uh, Favorite did, show. right, did a show. They found out about him and they did a show and they posted his picture. And somebody called and they were like, I think that's my neighbor. And they caught him and arrested him. Oh, my God. I always think that show is for nothing. And here we are. It's working. Right? Apparently. At least in John List's case. Dang. So, that's my little kind of connection to the Watcher House. Yeah. Which, that, that miniseries ends here because that's the only thing I've got. I'll have to look up another New Jersey crime. <laughs> Just, I'll make a connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Oh, that's crazy. So, lots of dead kids for me. And yet, somehow, I'm still almost more mad about yours. Yeah. Because he didn't really get in trouble. No. From what I could read, he's not really in trouble now unless he's dead. But, I mean... I hope he's dead. I mean... I hope he's miserable. I hope nobody ever loved him again. hmm. Well, let's wrap this up so you can go home and go to bed. Okay. (laughs) Not going to fight me on that one, huh? No. Okay. So, guys, thanks, everybody, for listening to this week's episode of Crime Crazy. We hope that you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed making it, even though Jordan... Is dying. Is dying again. But we still had fun. Yes. Yeah. And Jordan got to drink lots of tea. Yes. Chamomile. And we got to interview Tobin. Oh my god, that was so cute. That was the best part. <laughs> That's a highlight of the episode. Yep. Anyway, so hope you enjoyed listening. Um, if you like our show, please tell a friend or go on iTunes and rate, review, and subscribe. Mm-hmm. Really, 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 we want your ratings and your reviews on iTunes. That would be excellent. Of course, we would love to give you a shout out on our show. If you do, leave us a review on iTunes. And if you leave a review anywhere else, just let us know because we want to give you a shout out there too. Um, if you loved our show, you could consider donating to our Patreon account. Uh, we made up a whole bunch of really cool surprises that yeah. we want to send anybody who does support us through Patreon. Um, Instagram is definitely my thing, and I like checking that one, so please follow us and comment on the pictures. Um, that one is at Crime Crazy Pod. Yeah. And I think we're getting better about posting pictures from our episodes. Yeah, so I mean, when we're talking about stuff, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to find a picture of the love doctor but if you do let's just do a picture of his face and not any of his surgeries no 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 and definitely don't post a picture of his books we don't want to advertise for him no or his family or anybody else uh we're also on twitter i'm on twitter all the time um (laughs) so that's also at crime crazy pod and then facebook we have a page and a group. So really you should be able to find us anywhere on Facebook. On Facebook. Absolutely. Um, and then of course our Patreon information, we are crime crazy and there's also a link in our Facebook group and yes. I will eventually put one on Twitter and Instagram as well. Okay. Um, and then of course you can always email us if you have a longer story or if you just mm-hmm. want to talk. Uh, <laughs> we're at really? crime crazy podcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. All right. So shout outs this week go to Amanda M who is my friend who gave me the story idea for um, poor Mary Fagan mm. and poor Leo Frank. Mm. I, I feel bad for just both of them. But either way, thank you, Mandy. That actually was a really fascinating story. You were right. Um, also, Morgan P., who left us a review on iTunes. Oh, and yeah. also Christy F., who has left us a review on iTunes. <laughs> And um, those are all the shout-outs I have, but I did want to also mention that all of our episodes are now up on YouTube. Oh, yeah. So if you like just some background noise, there, there's no video or anything to go with it, but just some background noise while you're working or whatever else, mm-hmm. find us on YouTube. And, and then, you can search for Aaron and Jordan or Crime Crazy. or And most phones already have YouTube downloaded on it, so there's true. no excuse now. There is absolutely no excuse. <laughs> so if you have an iPhone, we're on iTunes. And if you have an Android, you definitely have YouTube because Google owns that. Yep. 
All right, so my dogs say it is time for bed. So thanks very much for listening. And remember, even though we really have no idea what we're talking about, we'll be back next week to talk about it again. Bye. Thank you for listening to Quan Crazy. It is on iTunes. Please give my mommy and dad some money. <laughs> on Patreon? On Patreon.